Hi, welcome to SG Project Gallery and um, Practice Best Practices Workshop. Why haven't you started your art collection yet? Um, we're glad that you're all here. We have a great panel, we have some audience, and um, we are uh, looking forward to hearing your questions after they tell us a little bit about why they started their art collections. So I'm going to turn it over to Jamie, who is our moderator for the evening. Take it away. Thank you. Um, my name is Jamie Renzi. I'm the curator of New Bedford Art Museum Artworks. Thank you guys for being here and thank you to our panelists. Um, we are going to talk about collecting art um, and all these lovely people have art collections. Uh, Xander is an artist who, um, and a community organizer who, um, oh, I own some of Xander's work and uh, Xander and I have had many a conversation about pricing artworks. Um, and I think that you have some interesting thoughts around that too, so we'll talk about that. Um, down here on the end, we have Blake Hudson. Blake, um, I'm going to let you say a little something about yourself. Tell me where you live and describe your art collection in three words. Go. Hey everybody. My name is Blake Hudson. I currently live in Albany, New York. I'm a structural engineer, so while my career doesn't lend itself to art per se. Um, I do have a strong interaction with both my family as well as my friends in the art world. Uh, if I had to describe my collection in three words, I would say personal. I would say utilitarian, in a sense. And I would say me, okay, I would describe my art collection. Okay. Uh, Xander Morrow. Xander, um, tell us where you're from and um, I, do you, I mean, I feel like your whole house is an art collection. <laughs> so if you want to talk about a little bit about your collection, but also uh, the Dirt Palace, um, and then we're also going to talk about the Wedding Cake House too. Okay. What was the first thing I was supposed to talk about? Where are you from? Where, where, do, you, where do you live? I live in Providence, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. um, I've been a practicing artist for about 20 years, and I work in printmaking, which is a medium that lends itself to multiples and trading things with other artists. So most of my collection has come through kind of um, collaborations and trading stuff with other artists. I also work in posters, which is also like a very specific kind of collectible um, uh, market or media, and um, so that's been part of the kind of trading. Um, but yeah, there's other stuff. I I mean, I collect a lot of different kind of things, and I've always felt that there is an interesting relationship between collecting, even just stuff on the street, um, and creative practice. So that's those things have kind of fed each other in different ways, um, and then have um, been part of an art space for 19 years that. I think maximalist might be a way to describe it. I think often people try to, when they think about building collective spaces, strip everything back in order to kind of like create a backdrop that many people feel comfortable with. And our approach has been like, everyone just keep adding to it. And so the it's kind of become a layer cake of different artists who've been in the space at times. And it's, it's actually kind of been a space that's built itself into a collection, just sort of organically. Does that make sense? And now we're doing a second project um, that we hope will do that as well, but that we're jump-starting by um, commissioning a number of artworks, a number of artists to do actual restoration pieces. So everything from like hardwood floors to tiles and stuff like that. I feel like I've already done too much talking in my intro, so <laughs> <laughs> I'll jump back, but that's the, the overview. Okay. and. Alex, hello. Hello. Um, Alex, tell us where you're from. Tell us what you do. Um, and three words to describe your collection. Um, Alexander Jarden. I'm from New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, I am mainly a landscape designer. Um, I do a lot of work with drafting, drawing, and painting also. Um, in my art collection, in three words, uh, still in packages. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, kind of sounds like mine right now, too. Mm -hmm. um, and then last, uh, Richard Connor. Richard, um, tell us what you do 
and uh, where you live, um, and three words. One of them has to be dolphin. Oh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say dolphin up front because okay. I study dolphins. I'm a biologist and uh, been working on dolphins my entire career. Uh, I live here in New Bedford, and three words to describe my collection. I can describe my collecting habits. Okay. Impulsive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, collection's diverse, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, that encapsulates it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Impulsive and diverse. It's cool. That could be um, someone's like Tinder profile. <laughs> um, all right, guys. Now, um, when you think about your personal collections, uh, I'm curious if you've noticed, this is kind of like the, the three words was kind of a warm up to this, but like um, any trends that you see in your collection, like when you're walking around your house and you're just like, wow, I'm like really into bears or like whatever it is. <laughs> what sort of uh, trends do you find in your own collection? I'm gonna let you start. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, trends. I don't think there is a particular trend. I, it's I that really diverse. am kind of all over the map. Okay. Um, I, I just, res I, I think I get my sort of intellectual input through science. Mm -hmm. So I respond to art that gives me an emotional impact. And that can be through color alone or, or the subject matter of the painting typically or, or whatever. So that's why I have a, diverse range of styles, because you can get that impact from all kinds of different styles of art. Okay. Any other thoughts and trends that you see in your own collection? Um, I realized one day that most of the works that I had, the subject matter was women. Mm -hmm. And that was just one day randomly, I just happened to look around and I saw that most of the, the pictures that I had were, were imagery of women, usually just posing or you know, kind of like doing something. Um, and then also on top of that, uh, my collection is heavily influenced by my education in landscape design and like uh, urban planning. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of works that I've collected um, kind of reflect my, uh, just having grown up in a cityscape, you mm -hmm. know, not so much um, rural landscapes. Okay. Um, I think if there's a trend, maybe it's illusion or transformation like objects like I'm thinking of like lamps that are made out of popsicle sticks or things that have had one incarnation that then are given another incarnation through someone's hand or um, and that takes a lot of different forms like there's one piece probably the piece I paid the most for that I love the most is um, like a, a mask that's made out of a, a Vespa muffler so something like Ooh, that's that. cool yeah. And you described your uh, collection as personal. What yes. sort of personal trip, like, what makes it personal? Yeah, so a lot of the art that I have hanging on my walls, I can draw a memory from, or I can relate it back to someone in my life. You know, so I have a lot of pieces from family members that may have since passed. So mm -hmm. I kind of keep things up in certain places in my apartment to almost, you know, pay homage to them and kind of remember them through that way. You know, I have a lot of pieces that kind of mark milestones in my life where when I'm, you know, walking by, brushing my teeth in the morning, I can kind of look over and that brings back like a rush of memory in my head. So I kind of can feel, you know, almost quickly connected to something and then kind of move on mm -hmm. through my day. So, one of the things I wanted to talk about was, um, like, affordability. You know, getting art, uh, purchasing art, acquiring art, and doing it in a way that doesn't like totally break the bank. Like, I don't know, well, so you've actually talked about your degrees, but I have an MFA, which means I have like, that I made some sad choices and I don't make that much money. Um, but I have purchased works from this gallery um, who they, uh, SMG keeps stuff pretty affordable here. Um, what, so I'm, I'm always interested in like how people who um, don't have like a lot of maybe startup <laughs> income can start this collection because I think that's the most intimidating thing about it. Um, so when you first started collecting, um, this might be a kind of uncomfortable, but like, like why did you first start collecting and what was your price range? And I can start this so no one feels weird, but 
Um, I started collecting my collection in um, undergraduate, and, uh, and I did a lot of trading. Um, now, like my work is not something that people like want to own, and I don't say that to be self-deprecating, but like I don't think anyone wants like a 16-foot sculpture made out of hot glue. So <laughs> I was doing a lot of trading for um, for jobs. Uh, I would trade an artist a print, and I would help them pull the print or something. So it would start from like labor, and then maybe I would spend up to a hundred dollars um, when I was an undergrad, and now. I think I would spend up to 500 on a piece. And that, but that would be, I usually, like two, 250 is, is, feels like a lot, but worth it. Um, who wants to start? When did you start collecting? What was your price range? I can start that. Okay. Um, 2013, I got a small inheritance from uh, a great aunt who my little baby brother had hugged. So she left him like $30,000. Cool. And that got split up between a number of cousins, so it wasn't wasn't a lot at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I walked into Ugly Gallery downtown New Bedford, um, became friends with the owner, uh, and there was a piece on the wall by a graffiti artist, uh, Indy One Eighty Four, and I think I paid like two hundred and fifty dollars for it. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, that was a lot of money for artwork for me, um, but I wasn't thinking about how much you know a person actually spends making pieces and how much. Uh, I, you know, just an individual makes in a week for you know a normal job. Yeah. Um, I think most people that I'm familiar with make anywhere between four hundred to a thousand dollars a week. I don't know if that's you know um, in alignment with everybody's salary, but that sort of seems where most people that I know are at. Um, and I kind of had to just put aside the idea that hey, there's this chunk of change that I'm going to spend. What would I normally? use that money for. I have friends that go out on the weekend and spend $150 at a time, and they do that every weekend. Um, but they, if you tell them, hey, this piece is $150, and they're like, oh, I don't, that's a lot of money, maybe I'm gonna go get something from Target. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my introduction immediately was kind of the $250 price range, um, but then as time went on, I'd say honestly a couple months, I was starting to look at the prices of works that some of my at the time favorite artists were doing, and they were all you know within that range. Um, the hardest part I think to to actually do for myself was actually not to go in, into debt after that to actually buy work because I you know didn't have a lot of money. I'm, I was just out of school, um, and yeah, like I I just had an issue not hitting the, the add to cart button, basically, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, on a lot of websites. But after a while, I was able to kind of pull back my, my habit. Um, I was buying pieces, honestly, like once a week for, for quite a long time. Um, and in, in the beginning, it was sort of for fun, but also because I realized that some of the artists that I was looking at, their works would be almost immediately on the secondary market for two or three times the actual price that they were purchased at. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, I was going for investment. And then secondary, do I like this piece? Um, I've kind of shifted you know, to a different view where I'm usually buying things that I like now because the idea of trying to make money off of artwork kind of became stressful and that wasn't a job that I really wanted. Yeah. Um, at this point, I, I'm not really hesitant to spend you know, 1000 or $2,000 on a piece, mm -hmm. um, but that has to be something that you know, I, I really, really want and I'm not looking necessarily for, for the investment value anymore. Could you explain to us what you mean by secondary market? And um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think my view of collecting is a little bit different than a lot of people's um, because I kind of uh, saw it sort of like the way that, um, to my understanding, people buy and resell sneakers now. Um, okay. Sort of like, I, I, I'm going to use the term hype beast, you know, mm -hmm. that, that hype beast uh, mentality where um, there's a lot of mainstream artists right now who are becoming really popular, mostly because of clothing, uh, streetwear clothing, um, and then the hip hop industry as well. Um, a lot of the, the big players in those industries are collecting and showing people via social media that we're collecting, you know, Cause, uh, Daniel Arsham, um, uh, Takashi Murakami, um, and that was sort of what I was going for, was buying those pieces that I knew were, were really main, had a lot of mainstream popularity. Um, the secondary market uh, was pretty much basically eBay. Um, you can go on eBay and you can find, um, uh, let's say, Anthony Lister, 
Um, not so much David Cho anymore. Uh, Daniel Arsham specifically right now, his, a lot of his pieces, his, uh, his editions, uh, as soon as they sell out within, you know, an edition of 500 sells out in like 90 seconds, um, almost immediately there's people re trying to resell those pieces for two or three times the amount on eBay. Yeah. Um, so I started off buying um, David Cho, Anthony Lister, uh, Daniel Arsham, um, Swoon, and almost immediately any when those were re like I said when they were purchased you'd find them um, on some sort of art selling website or eBay um, and that's really from as time has gone on in the past five or six years that market which people are calling flippers they're calling that flippers that's kind of a frowned upon mentality <coughs> it took me a little while to understand why that was frowned upon mm -hmm. um, because you're basically buying something that somebody else may want the opportunity to buy but you're only buying it to, to double up your profit off of somebody else's work right so that's, that was sort of my introduction, yeah. um, and then I had to kind of like guide my moral compass to kind of figure out this isn't you know, what I'm trying to do with my work. But that was my initial, um, yeah. that's how I got into it. Um, my first major purchase was a, an edition of 38 David Cho print. Um, I think I spent $1,200 on it, and two weeks later I sold it for $1,900. Mm -hmm. I then bought a, a, a piece by Swoon. Um, it was an edition of 64, I paid 1200 for that, and then eventually purchased, I think, 10 Anthony Lister pieces for $100 each. Mm -hmm. um, those 10 pieces that I had purchased, uh, the secondary market value immediately went up. I think I paid two, $2,500 for all of those pieces and the collection is valued at, um, it's, I don't wanna say it's worth, but it's valued at uh, about $8,500 to, $8, to $10,000 at this point. Do you insure all your work? No. That's something I need to actually do. And I've been looking <clears throat> into that a little bit more recently. Um, I've kind of just, uh, hope that wherever I store my stuff, it doesn't burn down. Yeah. Essentially, do you so you can't really insure. You, well, you have to get it all individually appraised, and every five years or something, it's not practical. Yeah, I mean, I wonder, <laughs> like writing, like, um, like writing a, a a list of its declared insurance value out, and then having that be on your home owner's yeah, insurance. Definitely. But still, I mean, these are uh, if they're not additions, this. Like what you're gonna get, a gr oh, maybe a grand for a, a painting that you lost in a buyer, but mm -hmm. you still lost that painting in a buyer. Mm -hmm, yeah. So, um, Xander, I, Xander and I have had a couple conversations. Sort of coming off that, I'm gonna kind of pivot here. Um, now, Xander and I, so Xander, you have a couple of posters. You were talking about posters. I think there's a couple of these that are flipping through here too. Um, but. Um, you keep your posters like really reasonable and can you talk about why you do that um well because i think the market is pretty flooded in rhode island there's mm -hmm. just so many um printmakers um and i also think it's you know it's like so it's a, it's a tricky thing because i do not so much with posters but with prints i sell both like working through a gallery in new york and in rhode island it can be really hard to find price points that meet the needs of both kind of situations. Um, and I've sort of settled at certain places for certain things. And um, <coughs> posters, because some of my limited edition prints end up being higher than most of what kind of people who are my peers and um, friends in Rhode Island would spend on artwork, yeah. um, I keep the like print, the poster pieces uh, uh, cheaper. And I think posters just generally have, like they just live at a different, at a different, Unless you're like Shepherd Fairy or something that's super duper collectible, they mm -hmm. just kind of live in a different um, realm. Yeah. Well, and then there's a whole yeah. like poster culture in Providence yeah. too. Yeah. Where like if you have an event, there's usually a screen printed poster. It's this very beautiful special thing that in and of itself outside of the event is great. Um, when I first moved to Providence, it was like, oh, if you're gonna have an event, you gotta have, you gotta make a poster for it. And I was like, oh my god. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and also printmaking is a major thing that the Dirt Palace yeah. like, uh, yeah. supports. And do you want to talk about how printmaking is supported through the Dirt Palace? And um, well, there's a communal s studio that people have access to to do screen printing, which helps make things happen. Because it's, it's not a crazy setup to do screen printing, but it's enough of a pain that having easy access to something is definitely helpful. Um, but yeah, it's just never, I mean, there are, I mean, I have seen stuff get flipped and that always does feel a little bit weird. 
Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. I don't. Um, it's always made sense to me to keep stuff kind of at least certain things at a lower price point, just because it's like I'm making things for a practical purpose. Usually when I'm making a poster, either I'm doing it for something I care about or I'm commissioned and already getting paid to like produce that work. So yeah. then anything I sell is just kind of like um, something that comes on top of what I'm expecting. So it, it, um, yeah, it works out to be okay to be able to. And I don't usually sign her number. So. Oh, okay. Um, how did, so you said that, uh, like that a lot of your family influenced your collection. Yes. Um, did you inherit works, or did you, were, are you like going into parents' house and being like, I want this one? Yeah, so it was, I think, a mix between basement diving and stealing things off walls. Cool. <laughs> so when I graduated college and moved out of my mom's house in 2016, I finally had my own space to kind of present everything. So I went, um, you know, I, on my dad's side of the family is incredibly creative. So I pulled, you know, artworks from each, you know, each aunt, each uncle, my grandparents, and kind of tried to pull pieces that either I grew up around or kind of spoke to me in a way where I felt connected to it. Um, something also just kind of going back to the idea of um, reselling um, a good portion of my collection, so to speak, um, kind of lies in vinyl music, and uh, less so the music, but more so the jacket art and kind of unique prints and, you know, special kind of rarity types. Um, I know just like in the past, I've, you know, signed up for newsletters to get them free, and I've been willing to pay up, paid up to close to $600 for individual records. Oh, that's you awesome. Know, just for whether it be, you know, special color variants, um, particular jackets that may have had some type of printing error, because I like that. I like the uniqueness and the individuality of it, you know, and I have friends that'll laugh and think it's funny, and then people on message boards will say, like, I can't believe you actually play this, like, I can't believe you listen to it, but my feeling and connection with it is that I have an ownership over it, and it should be utilized in the way it was meant to be portrayed, you know, and I feel that I couldn't resell something like that, because it's kind of become personal for me. So you're like the sneaker collector who actually wears the sneakers. Yes. That's cool. 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 <laughs> yeah. How do you display records? Um, so uh, kind of going back to that, um, where my family's creative, um, my dad lives on a farm out in Pennsylvania and every time I go and visit him, I go and I steal a bunch of slats and I make slits in the, sl uh, in the slat and I have them uh, hung up all over my apartment mm -hmm. and I'll kind of rotate through whatever I kind of feel like for that day or that week and I'll put a bunch up and then as the, you know, the music's playing in my apartment, I'll grab one off and I'll, I'll switch it out and I'll put it back into the shelf and I'll pull a new one out and kind of flip through it. Um, that I feel kind of does two things for me. You know, one, it, it kind of sets the mood almost, mm -hmm. like in my apartment itself. And uh, two, kind of lets me explore through the music because I probably have a little over about a thousand different vinyls themselves. So, I don't always get to listen to everything. You know, there's a lot of new stuff, a lot of old stuff in there. So by kind of rotating through it and displaying it, I'm displaying it for people to come to visit and displaying it for myself. Um, are there any uh, other like not specific art objects that you guys collect, like like vinyls or I mean Xander like? <laughs> um, yes, I have a really robust collection of um, air freshener trees that I find when I walk around. That's awesome. Um, I mean, mostly stuff that I find like when I'm walking or um, like also, I mean, there's stuff I'll use in my art. Like I have a few trunks full of like weird toy, like parts of things and stuff. But yeah, I, I have... It's interesting because I feel like a lot of artists who I came up with were really like felt like I felt like collected a lot and felt like kind of taking care of material things was like part of our job as artists to kind of really engage in this way and to like almost have like an encyclopedic knowledge of like oh that kaleidoscope from that time you know it was just and this was like kind of early eBay so people were also like it just felt like junk was like and kind of thinking about like the detritus of hyper capitalism was something that people were processing through by objects coming into their circulation. So 
yeah, it's always been like in my consciousness and mm -hmm. process. And, yeah. Other. I'm trying to rack my brain thinking about that. Um, I don't know if it's not really any different objects, but I found that uh, children do really, really cool drawings sometimes. Mm -hmm. So if I if I meet you know a friend's um, son or daughter or, or or child and they draw something cool, I'm usually like, hey, can I have that or mm -hmm. can I give you five dollars for that? Mm -hmm. You know. And I remember when I was really young and I first made my first like dollar twenty five at a yard sale, how excited I was. So I mean, I'm not sure every you know child is big sto like stoked to to make money off of something. Right. But if uh, if I you know meet somebody and like, hey, you did a really cool drawing, I. I I want that. Can I have that? You know, yeah. um, that's just another part of collection that that I found. I just appreciating line work, color composition, and forms that somebody who may not necessarily understand design mm -hmm. um, kind of produces, and that's really cool. Well, and even in that action of like with a kid, let's say you're you're acknowledging that they made something, and then you're like quite literally adding value to it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're starting someone at a young age. Uh, understanding that art is a thing that should be valued. Um, and uh, so that's very cool, yeah. Well, I, I collect paintings, but mm -hmm. if I'm walking around and see something that strikes my fancy and the price is right, I have some masks, I have some ceramics, cool. uh, just whatever. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also collect hand trucks, which <laughs> yeah, I get cool. in trouble for. <laughs> Where are the hand traps? <laughs> Mostly in the basement. Oh, <laughs> All right. It's a valuable tool. Um, does anybody? Every end? time they get used, I, I, get, I feel like I'm vindicated. I'm like, see, yeah. see how handy it is that I have this thing? <laughs> what, what makes a full collection of hand traps? Like, how many do you have? Oh, well, there's like inflatable tires, hard tires. There, I can, you know, like there's just dollies. Found yeah. objects, right? Found yeah. objects are. Yeah. So you know, there was a sorry, show on for a while. This is great. I love that. All kinds of collectors, people collected vacuum cleaners and all kinds of things yeah. like that. So yeah, there, there was, I remember one guy collected blenders. So <laughs> people are collectors. <laughs> Dra <laughs> drafting <laughs> tools too. Oh yeah. I forgot about that. Drafting tools. Cool. Yeah. Definitely. Old school, new school, whatever is lying around, I'll use it at some point. So I, I wanted to go back to the issue of I do want to touch on the issue of price. Uh -huh. Because if you are patient, you can find really good art for really cheap. So there's all kinds of venues, and I bought it all of them, where you can buy art. And it's eBay, and it's junk auctions, and real auctions, and Brimfield, and yard sales, everything. And if you take the time, you know, you might find a Matisse in a yard sale. It's unlikely. But you can find some really good art very inexpensively mm -hmm. um, by doing that. A lot of people don't have time to do that, but if you do, there's, there's a lot of good art out there at very affordable prices. Well, and then there's also things like uh, Shameless Club this weekend here at Hatch Street. It's just, it's, I mean, this place is all artist studios and it's just open and you can mill through here. And I, I think last time I did that, I bought a print for like 35 bucks. Um, and uh, this is, this is, there are artist spaces and there's usually open studios at these spaces. There's also like usually around Christmas time or the holiday season, there'll be lots of uh, like artists and fairs where you can get some art for a pretty decent price. Any other sort of tips of where you can get decently priced artwork? Ooh, that's a good question. I love farmer's markets. It's mm -hmm. kind of just me. Um, you know, I, I don't usually go for art. I go for produce. I go for the kind of the mom and pop shop type stuff. But when you do find art there, I found that that's where you can kind of get the most reasonable price for something because it's not a venue where you would go to specifically purchase art. Yeah. Well, Alex, do you prefer Alex or Alexander? Alex. Alex. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about buying stuff through social media? Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, so the, I told you earlier that I started collecting, uh, 2013, um, when I got a small inheritance, I actually, uh, about a month or two later, I'd spent a month or two later, I had spent the whole inheritance that I had had. Um, but I was in California working on a weed farm actually. And I was listening to a podcast, um, David Cho mm -hmm. and come to find out, um, he was selling one of his most affordable pieces of work ever. Uh, it was literally just uh, I actually think it's kind of ugly it's a, a a picture of a piece of pizza mm -hmm. um, and 
I purchased this piece because I was listening to it through a podcast and then it was connected to his Instagram account. Mm -hmm. um, I had at this point kind of been following a few artists because um, social media was more present in my mind around 2012, 2013 is when I started using so Instagram more. Mm -hmm. um, and I was kind of just obsessive, like looking for new artists and looking for people who I might like. Um, and then I found that through social, uh, through Instagram, a lot of these artists uh, are accessible to speak with as long as you kind of uh, aren't wasting their time, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, if something pops up on their feed, this happened more than one time, I've seen a picture and be like, hey, is this for sale? 50% of the time I don't get a response, 50% of the time I do. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I'm a little taken back by the price of something mm -hmm. and I kind of try to work it so it's not, I'm not asking and then I'm not talking about it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm not revisiting the conversation. I don't like to ask somebody over and over and over again and never buy anything. I think that's something that happens a lot with a lot of creatives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing that I try not to do. I'll wait for something that I really, really like, but I kind of shamelessly ask anybody if everything's for sale. Mm -hmm. um, and Instagram, I have found that I've been, been able to speak to a lot of my favorite artists directly through Instagram. Um, yeah. I think I mentioned earlier, I've collected a number of Anthony Lister prints um, in an original drawing. And when his first came up for sale in 2014 or 15, um, I clicked the link in his, uh, his uh, Instagram page and it wasn't working. So I just emailed him and we had a quick conversation back and forth. Uh, Anthony Lister is one of the more well-known contemporary artists in Australia right now. Um, so we had a quick back and forth and then I, when I, when everything worked out and he said thank you for telling me my site wasn't working, I ended up receiving the first, um, the number one uh, out of a hundred in this specific edition. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of just being able, just saying hey I want this or something, something popping up and me just enjoying it mm -hmm. um, and kind of just putting myself out there and asking. Um, at this point, I, most of my, I think there's 2,000 people on my Instagram that I follow, most of them are artists. Mm -hmm. So when I look through their stuff, if there's something that I really like or I think is worth collecting, I'll just honestly ask. And that's the easiest part about it. Yeah. Um, and that's really, really cool because I think otherwise, I don't know what it is about that platform, but otherwise it's, those aren't really people that you can access on a regular basis. Um, a lot of a lot of famous artists, it's, there's a lot of people trying to talk to them. I wouldn't really want to try to entertain conversations with everybody, but it just so happens that that's the market for creatives right now um, for being able to showcase and then get it directly out rather than going through uh, a middleman. Yeah, well it's interesting too, like the, um, the, the form of uh, Instagram might allow for people who are maybe like a little less bold or a little more shy mm -hmm. to, um, it creates like a very nice buffer where yeah. you send a DM and it's just like, I don't, this might never come back. Yeah. Um, okay. Thoughts, feelings, how are we all doing? Well. Okay, really quickly, I wanted to ask when we were talking about questions, does anybody in the uh, crowd collect something weird other than art? Yes. <laughs> uh, I collect street garbage. <laughs> street garbage. What else? Just shout them out. Collecting street garbage. Any animal skulls? Animal cool. skulls. That's cool. Cool. Not necessarily me, but my sister collects Monopoly sets. Okay. okay. Well. Including the game pieces. She goes to flea markets all over Florida. Every time they come out with a new edition, she adds it in. I think she's got about 200 different game sets. Crazy. Including crazy. like an original 1930s one. I feel like in our house, I collect a lot of scissors, but not on purpose. <laughs> like a thousand scissors. Um, all right. Uh, do 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 do. Is it, so speaking about Instagram, I just uh, totally distracted myself. But um, what advice would you have any of you for artists who want to sell their stuff? on Instagram, like like if you're looking at the stuff all day, are there any, not all day, you, I'm sure you do other things. Uh, I, I, I find myself on Instagram more than I'd like to, <laughs> for sure, so. Um, what are, do you have tips for artists, like, um, uh, on how to get their stuff out there through social media? Um, I think the, I've experienced this myself um, through my social media, it's the more often that I put something um, out on social media, the more interest uh, continually I'll find. Like if I don't post something for six months, I may not see something pop up. Um, I may not see somebody who's interested in, in, in any of my work particularly. Um, but the, uh, 
it really seems like if you just post an image of a, fo of a single photo of a piece that you have um, with a brief description, it, when you scrolls by, there's usually something that whatever it is, my brain's working. I'll just I'll see something. I'm like, oh, that was interesting. Maybe I'll go back to that. Mm -hmm. So if you can post something that's not necessarily a lifestyle image, or if it's just the work itself, when you kind of scroll by, even at a quick pace, you might see something. It might be a color. There might be a form that just catches somebody's eye. Um, and if you're interested in selling your work, it's it's a pretty easy place to I think do that. But again, the biggest um, problem that I've had. Uh, or I've seen, I should say, is people asking for to buy pieces and then not necessarily following through with it. Yeah. Um, so that's something I think that that's the in regards to selling stuff. I think one thing that people should keep in mind is you might have a conversation a million times telling somebody what a price is and them are never hearing about it. Um, but other than that, it's sort of the I think typical. Uh, typical just putting yourself out there, just put something out there that you you like, um, mm -hmm. but it is specifically just that. Just put the work out there, you know, um, and keep doing it, and you'll be able to, I guarantee you'll be able to sell your work that way. Any, any other social media insights for selling artists, artists who are selling things? I think it's sometimes not a bad idea for an artist to put one of their good works at, at the right auction. Hmm. Because you open yourself up to another set of collectors mm -hmm. if you are a listed artist. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, so it's not something bad to do. But you've got to target the right auction. Because as a collector, I love it when things I like show up in the wrong auction. <laughs> <laughs> I then I get really good deals. Yeah, I so. see. <laughs> how, do, how do artists even begin to navigate finding what the right auction is? Well, you have to see the kind of art they might sell. Or first, make sure they sell art sometimes at this auction. Yeah. And it's not, you know, like an American furniture auction or something like that, which I found really good art at. And, um, you know, Provincetown auctions, for example, for more modern art might work, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, but, you know, I've done that for artists. Got, you know, put their work in auction, got them listed. Yeah. yeah. I think if, uh, if you want to sell work um, any way that's not directly through yourself, through like a social media platform or a website, um, the information that I've been given from many of my friends who are pretty successful artists is they walk around the city and they go to galleries and they'll find a gallery that suits whatever their style is and you go in and ask. Um, and I'd say, I, I'm not really familiar with auctions, I want to kind of shift into that realm of purchasing at some point, um, but go f it's pretty easy to find it through Google now, um, certain places that sell certain things. and. If you want to put yourself out there, just ask. The worst that anybody can say is no. And a lot of people I know who are successful artists have been told no a hundred times, and it was that one time where it kind of worked out for them. Um, I think just not being discouraged is pretty much seems like the key to success. Or failing and learning from that failure and just building upon that. Um, I've also met friends who've produced work that didn't sell for five to 10 years, maybe even 20 years. Um, so just continually working and building, building a, a catalog um, I don't want to promise you that you'll sell your work, um, but if you have a catalog, then somebody who maybe sees something that you have that's current might want to take a look back and find something they like even more. Thoughts from that at the table? I would say I, I definitely do agree um, when selling art on social media, it kind of does lend itself more towards a younger audience, you know, and you're, especially when you have, you know, teenagers or so just kind of scrolling through their Instagram feed, you know, just by using the proper tags in your post to kind yes. of get it hooked yes, up absolutely. into a whole other, you know, stream of potential buyers, you know, so again, when kind of, I've never produced any work, I've purchased off social media before, you know, kind of looking for something that you enjoy or, you know, taking a recommendation from something like Facebook or Instagram even and kind of using that to jump over to the next artist or look at someone new is kind of a helpful way to maybe tap into some of those potential consumers. I guess since we're talking about this now, I'm going to go ahead and do what I said I would do, is I'm going to actually order some artwork through social media right now. I'm going to go to Percy Fertini Wright's uh, Instagram page, click on the link, and order a print. Cool. Yeah. So excuse, excuse me for a minute while I'm doing <laughs> And I thought I was impulsive. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Richard, I was, when I was reading your bio, you said something pretty interesting 
um, that you didn't believe like early advice that collectors become dealers. Um, and now you represent three art estates. Yes. <laughs> um, so first, can you talk about what changed your mind? Or how did that transition happen? So you just stumble into it. You didn't go looking for it. There was a, a local artist, Joe Alexander. A lot of people know I have his estate uh, upstairs here. And um, I just stumbled upon his work. He passed away a few years mm -hmm. earlier, and I was blown away by it. And uh, just the circuit a series of events, I ended up with the estate. Yeah. I owned a bunch and I also represent the rest for the family. Um, there's another case where I uh, was buying from a dealer friend of mine, a 1963 geometric painting. And I always like to research you know, artists I buy. I figured this guy was dead. But he was alive and living in Princeton, New Jersey, age 87. Became good friends with him and his wife. And I visited them and bought some more work directly from him. And uh, anyway, I rep represent that state now that he's gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Up to age 92, he was still like a kid painting. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and the other case was, again, a friend of mine who was wanted me to handle his work, you know, yeah. who was an artist. Mm -hmm. So that must come from a certain reputa reputation that you have of probably being a pretty nice person, um, <laughs> but also responsible. You know, and this, it, it sounds like it's so interesting how relational all of this is. It is, but in all three cases, I love the work. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's important if you're going to you know, sell some work by somebody, you got to really like it. Yeah, and so, now, just because I don't know a lot about representing estates, um, so you're, you're in charge of moving that artwork now? Or? Well, I have a lot of uh, art dealer friends who, who buy, say, mid-century estates, and that's a lot of what I get. I buy from them, and they'll buy an estate outright. Okay. In two cases, I haven't done that. I just sort of, uh, you know, get a percentage and sell it for the family. In another right. case, I just have the estate. Yeah. Um, so it can work different ways. Wow. And sometimes I kind of wish I hadn't taken it on, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know. Wow, that's 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 really. I mean, it's like the museum wants. We should yeah, it's it's. it's be left someone's estate. <laughs> overwhelming at times. Yeah, I bet. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the importance of buying art um, in your local economy. Um, you're in upstate New York. Uh, do you buy records from local musicians? Do you buy art from local folks? Or yes, how does I do. that work? Uh, I do. So again, uh, going back to like those farmers markets, mm -hmm. uh, definitely stay local. Um, I'm a big supporter of live music, and mm -hmm. then again, I try to purchase a record from them. Uh, and again, I think that lends back to the personal connection I have with a lot of the things I collect. Yeah. Um, as far as uh, like local bands go, yeah, I'm 100% into that. Again, it's kind of tethering that memory to something tangible. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of how I build my own personal collection. Yeah, and through a show or something, you are you know, you pay your ticket to get into the show, uh, you have an experience, and then when you buy a record from a band, especially a touring band, they're getting that money. Yeah. You know, it's not going through whoever. And then you get to take a part of that experience home, which I think is a lot of reasons uh, that uh, galleries are able to sell things. Yes. You know, we come in here, we go to um, a lovely opening, we have a conversation with the artist, uh, that opens up a door that maybe connects us emotionally to the artist, and then bam, we want to have the thing um, and I'm just so curious like what do you guys think it is in that like what is the thing that you're that we're trying that we're trying to get in that moment or to keep in that moment I think it's the connection with mm -hmm. the individual that created it and then sold it you know mm -hmm. I find that I have a distinct attraction to buying directly from whoever created whatever it is I'm buying you know because you can ask why did you do this how did you do this so forth and by creating having that conversation with them you're then, again, associating a memory, a conversation to it, and kind of building it up more than it's just, you know, it's just, you know, ink on paper. You know, you're connecting something kind of whole to something intangible. Hmm. Other thoughts on that? I have a few different ways that I decide to purchase something. Um, there's the one level of when, I'll relate it to when you're a kid and you go through the toy store and you really want something. Mm -hmm and you don't know why, you just want it. Um, that happens to me a lot, where, you know, just like, oh, I want this, I have to have this. Mm -hmm. um, 
Then there's the uh, sort of like, sort of sort of like what he was just saying. Um, you ask about it, how it was made. Um, you ask the process, the train of thought, and that's a kind of another way that I'll look at something, especially if I get to meet the artist. Um, one of my favorite things to do is ask what the process is. Um, something I was actually really bummed about when I went to Art Basel in 2014 was a lot of the uh, the gallerists couldn't tell me how a lot of the works that they were selling were made. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really important to me often that I can understand what the media was, um, what uh, what was going on in their brain when they produced it, what was the thought behind it. The concept uh, tr pretty much draws me in. Um, there, I did talk about there is the idea sometimes where the value might go up on something. I've actually made a couple of really bad purchases expecting the value to go up. And it's not that the value didn't go up, it's just I was like, why did I buy this, you know? Mm. Um, and that's, I, that's the last thing that I do now. I try to stay, stay away from that sort of mindset. Um, uh, in regards to, say, local artists, uh, I've been supported pretty heavily by a lot of my friends in the local community. Um, so if I see something that's that, hey, I gotta have this mentality, um, and it's a local artist, usually that's a like done deal for me. It's really difficult for me to kind of back away from that, even if I know that like, hey, maybe I don't have the money right now for this. I'm gonna find a way to allocate the funds just so I can get this person's work because if one, I really like it, and two, everybody has supported me. I wouldn't be where I am without everybody else, and I think it's important to kind of perpetuate that as well. Yeah, I, I think I mainly collect, you know, uh, dead artists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that being said, I have paintings from quite a few local artists. Yeah. Just because you're around here and you see it, and it's Guinness, I gotta have that. Mm -hmm. So, it happens. <laughs> so, Xander, um, the, the new project that you're working on is called The Wedding Cake House. Um, that, so, basically something that's really interesting about The Wedding Cake House is that you guys are creating a permanent collection, um, sort of like just like in the wallpaper and the, the handrails and whatnot, and then also sort of a long-term collection as well with the fat, flat and frame stuff. Yeah. Um, and in doing so, you're creating like really a, a living archive of uh, local artists, feminist artists. Um, can you talk a little bit about like, um, well, the same with the Dirt Palace, too. Um, why, what, what is the, the urge, how did you see the, where did you see the need uh, to create sort of such a community around local artists and their artworks? I mean, I think the community part came first. I mean, honestly, when we talk about, um, like, why do people collect things, I feel like that's become so adjacent and not central to, like, the process of mm -hmm. what um, and even making objects I think within you know I think within so many people who are circulating around art there's a sense that like objects to a certain extent are passe even mm -hmm. though I think there's a lot about being artists that has to do being an artist that has to do with the knowledge that you get from working with your hands and being very tangibly engaged with something that's physical and that involves just a kind of learning that's like kinesthetic um, that I think is really valuable and I always, you know, I, I'm super supportive of artists who are conceptual but also I'm like, but yeah, learn something from your hands too. Anyway, that's a digression. But I think this house is very much about acknowledging that there are so many skills that artists have and that the history of art, you know, in many ways, and it, I guess it has to do with sort of a feminist view of art history in that, um, you know, I think so much of what's exalted in the past in terms of fine art has been this like big idea, kind of like masculine conception of like how how art gets made. And I think we're much more interested in like craft and taking care of things and preserving things and upkeep and maintenance. And I think that the idea of like bringing artists in to repair. So this house where we've been renovating has been was abandoned for like 30 years and part of the process of renovating it has been commissioning a number of artists to, you know, to kind of deal with aspects of the space, but in a very built-in long-term way and to keep kind of like piling that up. And, um, you know, so artists have made tiles, they've um, done woodworking, plaster moldings, like all kinds of stuff that just are skills that artists have. Um, so now I'm like, where is this? 
Am I digressing? I think it's about, so I think it's like, um, it's less about the objects than about, but also I think it's like, how do people want to live with art? And I think that like, living with art in a frame on a wall is interesting, but I think like thinking about it being integrated into like, like I think just encouraging people to be like, oh, I could hire anyone to like tile my bathroom with some tiles bought at Home Depot, or would it be that much more expensive to like see if this local ceramicist makes tiles and what would it take to get them to like yeah. redo my bathroom? And it, it turns out it's like kind of not that much more expensive and that there's a lot of ways to do things that can um, you know, really inject energy into local economies, which I just think we're at a moment of like, what are our economies in New England? Like, how do we make these things work? Um, I don't believe any numbers around any of these things. I think there's like a lot of energy around like hitching a lot of hope to like arts as a star and I don't necessarily believe in that either. Like I just think we have to be really realistic and com and that understanding that community is going to be the heart of like how we think about what economy, where economies are built and how um, growth happens or something. I love that. Um, so the last part of my questions and then I'll open it up to you guys is a quick Pro tips. Um, we talked a little bit about this, um, but let's say I have no disposable income, but I want to start a collection. What do I do? Ooh, good question. Yep, train. TFP. Okay. What did you say? TFP time, time on prints. Yep, time on prints. What else? I have a little bit of money. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah, in this imaginary, well, not so imaginary. Fleet markets, junk yeah. auctions. Secondhand. Yeah. Oh, New Bedford antique shops. Yeah. I, I may be coming from a place of uh, privilege, I guess, when I, when I say this. Um, I think in regards to an in income, um, this isn't reasonable to say for everybody. I'll, I'll state that. So if I'm, if I'm leaving anybody out, I apologize. Um, it always seems like when, where there's a will, there's a way. And if you really want something, um, even if it's on, even if it's it's a little bit higher of a price point, the same way that it was told to me about you know saving your money um, for retirement or something like that. If it, even if it's a small amount, just ten dollars a week. Mm -hmm. At the end of a year, that's five hundred dollars. You can buy a really cool piece of art or a number of small pieces for for that price. Um, if that's not something that's reasonable, maybe there's a small side hustle you can do that doesn't take too much time up per week. But again, I understand not everybody's life allows for that. Um, not everybody may, some people may not even have an hour of their week to you know, do yeah. something that, that adds to that income. Um, yeah. Additional to that, going back to actually what you were talking about with the wedding cake house, um, I think what's really important to value is craftsmanship. Um, I'm coming from a place where everything around me that I see at some point was touched or designed by human hands. Mm -hmm. um, stuff from Ikea is stuff from Home Depot. And it's what value do you want to place on mass-produced objects versus objects that are uh, crafted by an individual craftsman. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you start placing more value on craftsmanship rather than just having something have to have it, um, if you place value on something that's made by an individual um, with their heart and their mind, versus, oh, I can get this, like tile, for instance, I can get tile at Home Depot for such and such a square foot per you know for dollars per square foot um, when you start valuing the craftsmanship you can look at everything as artwork and then when you're looking at everything as artwork inevitably there's going to be something you need in your life that you could consider artwork it could it could be a, a KitchenAid mixer somebody can look at a KitchenAid mixer and see that has see the artistic value in that I think maybe not necessarily limiting your mindset to art as canvas or photography but expanding your mind um, and saying everything you have is artwork. And that could be a t-shirt, it could be pants, it could be shoes. Just at, at some point in your life, value the craftsmanship, the unique craftsmanship, and you will bring something into your life that is our inevitably artwork. In fact, a lot of museum shows are now integrating uh, all these different uh, things, furniture with crafts and paintings mm -hmm. in one show from periods of time and so on. You know, it's really nice. Yeah, like the RISD's 20th Century Collection yeah. is, a, is one of my favorite curated yeah. spots because it's like there's a dress from that time yeah. period and there's a thing that's a great spot. Yeah. Helen. 
I just wanted to add quickly to that, if you don't have, and I don't like the term disposable income when it comes to art, mm -hmm. because you, you know, you're, you're, you're buying something that you don't want to dispose. It's just an interesting point, but anyway, a lot of small galleries, a lot of your local places, they will let you pay in installments. That's mm -hmm. what I was going to ask. Is and um, there is no reason not to ask. And it's better, and you know, uh, one of the things we always find out when we talk about art is it's the connections. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not the artist every time you're connecting with, maybe it's the gallery owner, but maybe that gallery owner is somebody your connection with will bring you to other art as well. Yeah. So it never hurts to ask. Well, that was one of my questions too, is like, oh, I want to start an art, art collection. I don't know where artists hang out, like, or I don't even know where to begin to start to looking on the internet. All right, what, what are your guys' suggestions for like, finding artwork or putting yourself in a position where you can spend that money? Uh, where, do, where do artists hang? Where, where do you buy artwork from? Besides, I know, like, do you go to gallery openings? Do you stalk people on the internet? What's the... Co-creative in New Bedford. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Go to Co-creative in New Bedford and I guarantee you will find something for you at a price that you'll be able to afford. If not, you'll find an artist there who will be willing to work with you. Um, and if not, then you'll find an artist there who could introduce you or a person who can introduce you to somebody who can work with the um, co-working spaces, uh, local galleries. Um, Again, I th I'm going to say I think I come from a place of privilege in that I don't necessarily have a problem talking to random people as strangers, and I know some people may have reservations about that. Um, I've spent a lot of years of my life working on my uh, those those sort of skills in regards to business, and I found that that helps me. Um, yeah. Is just being open to a conversation with anybody, and you don't really know where it's going to lead you. Um, but that's how I've mainly um, gotten involved in certain scenes and communities. Is just being okay with talking to a random person um, mm -hmm. and just express your interest. And usually people will say, oh, I know somebody or I know something you'll be interested in. Um, that's, New Bedford's particularly creative, so I'm not 100% sure about you know, other places. I've had success in other places, other cities, um, but I also am possibly wondering if that's because the people who I was introduced to those areas with knew what my background was. Um, so I, that's usually something when they think of me is on the forefront of their mind. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Having people identify you with that interest, you know, what, even if you're not creative, just if your friend knows that you're interested in something like that, I get text messages from friends all the time, did you see this show or do you know this person, have you seen this gallery, have you seen this work? Mm -hmm. um, just kind of having it as a part of your life, it will find you, it will come to you. That's true. But I'd be remiss not to state, especially in this location, Hat Street Open Studios. <laughs> yes. <laughs> lots of art, lots of artists avail art available and at good open prices. Open studios are cool because you don't <laughs> actually have to talk to anyone if you don't want to. You no. can just kind of like roam through people's stuff, like yeah. not their stuff, but like through their galleries and check stuff out. And then um, you can have, I don't know, you don't like, if you, if there's reservations about talking to people, you don't always have to. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to open it up. Do you guys have any questions for this this lovely crew or anybody else in the room? Sure. Um, one of the reasons that we wanted to put this um, workshop together was to get people started. Um, and like to, you know, get people to find the kinds of venues and, and the kinds of experiences that you started to talk about are like you know meeting people getting to know a little bit about the work and stuff um, how did you cross that threshold from I don't know anything to you're all now quite literate um, how did you cross that threshold into let me just walk in the room and get some free food and a glass of wine to start actually talking about the art huh? <laughs> well, so I'll say because my, my case was very unusual and kind of cliche it was a month in Paris and I was at university there, I had too much time. I had just a passing interest in art. And, uh, but I knew that, okay, I'm gonna be in Paris, I don't have to do much actual work for the universities. <laughs> I'm gonna go hang out in museums and galleries, and I did. And I looked and I looked and I looked, and, uh, and then that addictive part of my brain just went uh, short in it, I guess. And, uh, and that was that. Um, but, but it was, uh, I, I, I didn't have much previous interest or knowledge. Um, but you can learn a lot in Paris in a <laughs> Uh, for myself, I, 
uh, became acquainted with uh, BB. Um, he's a local artist, and he taught me how to use spray paint, um, and then told me about his favorite artists. And then I kind of became obsessive over learning how to use spray paint, to use uh, paintbrushes, pencils, um, use everything that I, I was in school for landscape design and I was trying to figure out vehicles to express my ideas so I didn't necessarily have to talk about it or do much other work. It was like, oh, I have an idea, I can draw it, somebody can see it. Um, as time went on, I wanted to get better at drawing and painting and I started obsessing over people's work and figuring out their techniques and their styles. Um, and that's sort of what led me into my knowledge that I have is I was interested in learning the craftsmanship um, and then it transitioned into now I know all this information I know about these artists the dead ones the new ones mm -hmm. um, so when I kind of decided to start buying artwork I had already had this small uh, I had this it wasn't wasn't very vast but I had this small understanding of the current art world at the time based on just my desire to want to be able to produce drawings and paintings. Um, and I had never taken art lessons before, so my curiosity uh, was kind of what pushed me into my knowledge of, of the art world. Admittedly, I don't know too much about art history. Um, the past, a lot of dead artists, I'm not very familiar with. Uh, I kind of, like I ex had said, got into this through social media in around 2012, 2013. Um, so my my knowledge is very uh, much mainstream. Yeah. Um, I do want to start learning more about art history, but I think my my desire to understand craftsmanship and uh, the human ability was sort of what pushed me into my um, just appreciation and desire to collect artwork. Yeah. Well. I think that the thing that's interesting about art is even though it can seem really intimidating because our history is vast, I think it's ultimately sort of about being alive and um, being creative and I think that people can respond to it on so many different levels and I think once you can get past like whatever intimidation there is of like our history, I, I think that everyone comes pre-built with their own instincts and there's, you know, I think that like it's about what you like and about what resonates with you and what you're interested in. So I think that like once you can kind of dig into that and just feel comfortable with that, then you start following paths and then curiosity, you know, just takes you down so many different paths and and then your life is over. <laughs> <laughs> you're just beginning. You're just beginning, yeah. Like that. yeah. yeah. I'd say Growing up, I've always had an infatuation with arts being exposed to it. Um, I kind of view it as a vocational skill where, you know, you kind of be remiss not to recognize the craftsmanship in an everyday object. You know, so to, so to kind of get your collection started, you know, I would lend towards something that, you know, an individual feels resonates with them, whether it be something that they like to look at, something that they like to hold in their hands, something that, you know, is done by someone who they just like. You know, so kind of finding what groove you want to get into and kind of be that gateway into the whole world of art. It's when I think about what sort of got me into my collection, besides just being around artists, but my sort of more local collection, how I live here, was uh, get, being an artist who got rejected for so many things. <laughs> um, and then at one time I was rejected, uh, and, but the person was very kind and said, but you should go check out the Dirt Palace. And so I did. <laughs> and, and that sort of brought me into this whole other world of, of uh, knowing artists and collecting from those artists. And the same here when I came into New Bedford, it was about wandering around Hatch Street. Uh, that's how I, I think that's how I met you guys. No, probably someone else, but whatever. That's how, that's how I started buying stuff from you guys. Um, you know, and uh, it, it keeps on going back to this idea of how it's so relational um, and the there's a there's a myth of the artist just sitting in her studio painting by herself and sure that might happen but at the end of the day if that stuff if she wants to move that stuff out she's gonna have to um, have relationships um, and so you know in the last sort of time that we have together after we thank these guys and if there's any more questions I would encourage you guys to talk to each other about s not just like your own collections, but stuff that you like. Um, look around the room. These guys have uh, like a, an amazing sort of like array of stuff just in this one space. 
Um, and, and ask each other for connections. You know, if you're into uh, 20th century artwork that you want to start collecting, I mean, maybe this guy, right? <laughs> um, you know, so uh, there's also like, like nonprofits um, are basically like a bunch of like nice nerds who want to help you out. <laughs> and so like, um, who are just overworked, but are stoked to be nice, I guess. Um, so like, <laughs> You know, wandering into Co-Creative Center, or wandering into the art museum, and just asking questions and looking around. And I don't remember which one of you said, what was you? said that it was just about when you went to Paris. It was just about looking and looking and looking and looking. And um, it's that's a major practice that artists do, but also collectors do mm -hmm. as well. Is learning how to look. Final thoughts from the uh, the crowd. Yes. Do you have? Um, do you have an experience? Do you have a regret? Like the one that got away? I know personally I have regrets and mm -hmm. pieces that I wish that I had bought. One? There's a whole bunch. You just bought this great painting and your bank account is empty and then you see this other one. <laughs> oh my God. But you don't have any money. Uh, uh, I, have a, I have a few of them. I have. Uh, a series of Anthony Lister prints I bought, I didn't collect the whole uh, uh, series just because I didn't know when it was going to end. So he kept producing work, like piece after piece, and it was, I think, two or three pieces out of the whole collection I missed out on. Um, same thing with Daniel Arsham, I missed out on collecting most of his, uh, in addition, um, he had an edition of small sculptures that he was doing, and I, for some reason, decided to only buy two out of, I think, the eight or nine. Um, and then the most recent was by a gentleman named Michael Vasquez from um, Florida, like Miami area. And I had sent him a message on Instagram. Um, he got back to me in a four inch by six inch painting study that he had uh, on acrylic was $600, which I was kind of taken back by the price for such a small piece. Uh, a month later, I found out that Swiss Beats owned the original massive, like the full-size wall piece. And he was, I had spoken to Michael about buying the small study, and I was really, really bummed when I found out that Swiss Beats owned the, 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 the large original, and I had missed out on buying the small piece. That one was the one that was like, wow, that was a really, really big mistake, and I hope that never happens again. So. Weirdly, sometimes those ones that you don't get come back. Mm -hmm. Even when you didn't buy it at auction, somebody else did. And few, some years later, oh, there it is again. And that's happened to me. <laughs> I will be ecstatic if that's, that's <laughs> the case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For sure. Yeah. Sander, regrets? No regrets. I, have regrets. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so either. I mean, again, comparatively, I think my collection is kind of in its infancy. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe I'll start regretting when I run out of wall space to kind of present everything, yeah. but you know, as of right now, I, you know, I, I draw happiness from what I collect, so I kind of feel I'm, I haven't made a poor purchase, and I've kind of, you know, approached each purchasing opportunity with saying, you know, either I want this or I don't, and if I want it, I'm going to get it. You know, that's kind of how I've approached my collection. Does that answer? I do have regrets. <laughs> When I, when I was in graduate school, they had a show of, of um, they had a bunch of Rembrandt plates, and they had done prints from them, and you could buy one, um, you know, four, four by six in size, and at that point, I could not justify spending 500, I mean, it wasn't even expensive, mm -hmm. $500, and now, like, that would have been a great investment <laughs> to have that, because, you know, those things only go up in price, I mean, clearly not an original, but from original plates. Um, and even more recently, I have, I've seen pieces recently at Gallery X um, where I saw it, I'm like, all right, that's cool, but it just kept coming back in my mind. Yeah. And even during this discussion, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> don't, so. don't regret it, because those things off plates that were way ahead of, of more recent, they didn't go up in price. And they may have, you might be able to find one at auction that, you know, was earlier or something. So. I love a good antiques road show, like, you yeah. know, <laughs> <laughs> when you get the gold coins. <laughs> At the end, yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you how many people call a museum asking <clears throat> about a painting that they found under their grandma's bed. Yeah. Um, it happens mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. I used to send them all to Janice, but now she's not. Yeah. Um, right here. I'll send them to you. <laughs> oh, careful. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
You know, I can look up on a website very easily and look at auction records. I do that for people all the time. Oh. Yeah, it's easy. Oh, I need to learn that. Give it out your phone number to... No, 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 that. <laughs> um, thoughts, feelings, anyone else? Final thoughts from the... Uh, um, I, I think the, the most important part of this sort of just collecting journey for me um, was something I had said earlier is looking at every single thing that exists in the real world as artwork in some way, shape, or form, whether it be even trash on the street. It is oftentimes I'll look, literally look at a piece of garbage juxtaposed against a rock, against a fence, and I'm like, wow, that's an absolutely gorgeous form. Mm -hmm. And it's really weird to say that, um, but when you kind of realize that everything at some point has been designed or touched by human hands or has gone through the human mind to actually exist, it's really difficult not to look at everything as artwork. Um, and then it's kind of just kind of figuring out what your preference is. Um, but I think when you finally get into that mindset, the world looks a lot prettier, you know? Um, and you find beauty in things that other people may not necessarily ever look at in the lifetime and say that that's really pretty. Let's end there. Yeah. I don't know, I totally. can't talk that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can we thank you guys? Um, thank you all for coming. I'm thank gonna, you. Uh, hand this over to Den. He has some things he wants to say to you. Just, just a little housekeeping. Um, we have a sign-up sheet for the practice best practice. If people want to add their email to it, we'll have it over there. Um, please feel free. There's also one for the gallery if you want to know what the shows we're doing here. We also have um, some evaluations, uh, if you'd like to fill out what you thought of what happened this evening. Um, I'll leave those here. And we also have um, information from some of the stuff that we've done before. You can kind of make your own um, packet if you want to put some stuff together from some of the pr previous handouts that um, you might find interesting. So help yourself. Um, do talk to these people. Talk to us. Talk to each other. Look at the work by the work um, <laughs> um, and spread the word because you know we really we're going to be doing a whole series of these and we really want these to become an important thing for the whole creative community um, locally and somewhat larger it's like the old-fashioned salon right mm -hmm. yes exactly mm -hmm. so I want to thank everybody who you know on the panel and I want to thank all of you for coming and uh, spread the word thanks a lot I have one more thing to say that I would be if I just Practice Best Practice is partially funded by generous grants from the Mattapoise Local Cultural Council and the New Bedford Local Cultural Council. I have to say those things because those people give us money and we're so thankful, but also the way we get money to do things like this is through um, documenting it. And so one of the ways we document it is these surveys. Uh, it, gives, it helps us give data back to our grantors. So if you would fill one of those out for us, that would be awesome. And it really should. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. a village to help somebody get their diploma it changes your whole life. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org.